Well, it's time is 23 minutes after the hour. I get so busy on my uh, annoyance with this voter ID thing that I didn't even introduce what's happening this morning. So you'll just have to fly around with the seat of your pants or by the seat of your pants with us this morning. But joining us now is Dana Benner. He's a Penardville resident. Uh, the Benners reach out to our adorable little radio show on Facebook. They found us there and uh, asked us if we would take a look into the Penardville Planapalooza results. We did. And I, I, I have to tell you that, uh, <laughs> first of all, if you recall the interview I did with city or town planner Brian Rose and chairman John Heichel of the planning board, um, you remember I asked one very specific and I thought on point question. And that was, why do you need a master plan for Penardville if all you're looking for are technical corrections that would uh, to your zoning ordinance that would take into consideration the more urban setting of Penardville in the more rural town of Goffstown. I thought it was a bit much. I, I also thought that if you were looking for better governance on these things that you could, well, I don't know, give the planning office in the city of Manchester a call and say, hey, you got neighborhoods that look like our neighborhoods. Can we take a look at your zoning specs? Oh, yeah. They don't even need to make the phone call because it's all on the internet. Anyway, so I saw this plan of Palooza, Wapapalooza, Wallapalooza, is that what they call them? Wallapaloozas, Dana? I have no idea. I know this one was called that plan of Palooza, so it's just a play on words. <laughs> and I thought, wow, these folks are not building on Penardville. They are deconstructing it and doing something else. But anyway, so Dana um, has apparently emerged in the community as a voice of opposition, and we're happy to let him speak his piece here at Dry at Large. Good morning, Dana. Good morning. Thank you for having me on. Good to have you. So a little bit about yourself. You're a Penardville resident, but you know, I, one of the things that I've noticed during this radio show is that there are, let me put it this way, people in power who... Um, have become rather adept at dim- dismissing the the average citizen and their thoughts and their ability to read and understand the English language. So I think it might be, in addition to you being a concerned citizen of Penardville, a good idea for you to maybe establish a little bit of your professional background so that uh, maybe you're not so easily dismissed by the powers that be. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to say that It's not only me that's doing a lot of this research that's digging this up. I'm having a lot of help from a lot of different people. So, you know, word has to go out to them. I'm not taking credit for any of this. Um, I do have a master's of education in heritage studies from Plymouth State University. I am a uh, professor of history and political science at a local college. I also teach and give seminars throughout the state and throughout the nation. So, um, and, and more importantly, I'm, I'm a citizen. I'm a resident of Penardville. I'm one of those people that they seem to overlook and don't give credit for having any you know, brain matter between their ears. <laughs> so, you know. I can attest to the fact that currently it's dripping out of yes, your ears, your yes. brain matter. There's so much there. Well, if it wasn't for the earphones, I, they probably would be all <laughs> over the place. So, I mean, it, what's happening here in, in, in Penardville is a fact that the bottom line is they're trying to change the zoning, as you previously mentioned, but what they're trying to do is change residential zoning into mixed-use zoning. Right. And for our listeners who, who aren't maybe familiar with Penardville, Penardville is largely, with a couple of exceptions, a uh, it's a lot like South Manchester in that it is uh, relatively small, single-family homes that are relatively close to their neighbor. Would that be fair? So yes. it looks like any, uh, you know, any sort of single family neighborhood, for whatever reason, South Manchester is coming to mind because that's what it reminds me of. Well, what it was, it is, it's, it's neighborhoods, it's, it's multi different neighborhoods. It's, it's rich in history. It's small businesses. It's everybody working together. And that's what drew me and my wife here almost 30 years ago, long before there was a Hannaford there. You know, or any some of this other stuff. We came here because we like the community, the community feel. 
Okay. And so you say that the zoning proposal, the plan, would turn Pennardville into a mixed-use neighborhood. Well, exactly. And and what that does is… Well, what kind of mixed-use, first of all? Well, mixed-use, when you look at zoning, it's it's residential, it's commercial, it's mixed-use. Those are the basic three basic ones. They they have little sub, you know, zones within all that. But those are the three basic ones. Yep. And basically, commercial is is business, pure and simple. It's business. Residential is homes, usually single family homes. Mixed use is you can have a small business mixed in with residential or or something. It, would, it allows you know commercial interests to come into an area. What they're trying to do is they're trying to change current residential into mixed use, which would open the door to multifamily complexes. Okay. So when you say they would open it up to mixed use, do you mean uh, the a mix of commercial? Now, why do you use a mix of businesses and residences? Well, that's what mixed use means. Okay. And you say that this is going to open the door for big multifamily complexes. Right. Why is that? Well, simply put, if you look, and I encourage everybody to go in to the com web address and look at the Plan Pennardville master plan that they're putting out there. Right. Now, there's a draft out there, and it's only a draft. When is the final coming out? Well, actually, the final is on their site. If you, oh, under, is there, you, you go under the... Um, Plan Pernardville Ad Hoc Committee, mm-hmm. they are going to find the, the new updated, revised, and improved, quote-unquote, um, plan, which is going to be going to the planning board. Well, actually, it's going to be going to the planning board soon, but there's a meeting on July 30th for the Ad Hoc Committee, which I encourage everybody to go, where everybody has their right to, to speak and l- read this thing. Um, and, and look it up and see what's going on. But, okay. you'll, but you'll, what you'll notice is on that plan that there is, they give credit to where the money is coming from. And what they're doing is it's, it's a HUD plan. It's a, yeah, well, we, we addressed that in the interview with Brian Rose, uh, which we'll link to when we put this right. article up. But uh, we talked about sustainability and the requirements of the grant, and, and he admitted that they were taking this grant money and that there was going to have to be, as a result, sustainability requirements built into it. So tell us what your understanding of what the sustainability requirements have done or would do to Pennardville if implemented. Well, what's the sustainability idea that they have is if you look at that planned Pernardville maps, if you look at, you could look at um, the Shaw's parking lot, you could look at the Hannaford parking lot. You could look at the corner of Daniel Plummer Road and Mast Road, where the ice house is. What their game plan is to do is to bring in multifamily apartment complexes, which basically is what that sustainable thing is. That's what HUD is trying to do. HUD is, uh, is the housing and urban development. They are not going to give the town of Goffstown money without strings attached it's government Mm -hmm. pure and simple the government does not give money to people without strings attached in some form or another trial large time is 28 minutes before the hour we are in studio with dana benner he's a pennardville resident that has got concerns about and is opposed to the plan pennardville document that uh, came out of a recent master planning effort sponsored by federal grants that came from HUD through the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. Correct. See, I did my reading. Um, well, let me let me ask you this. So let's just assume that you're right and that it would allow for the mass construction of multi-unit housing. Okay. Ooh, why would that be a bad thing? Why well, would that be wrong for Pernardville? Well, first of all, Pernardville, and if you look at... If you go right by Rite Aid, right in front of Rite Aid, there's a little park. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there's a sign in that park that touts the history of this area. And it states that it is a rural farming Commun- residential community. 
Mm -hmm. And it boasts this. Well, directly behind it is a multifamily unit right behind Rite Aid. Mm -hmm. well, so what they're trying to do is they're saying this is the reason why you should move here because it's so peaceful and family-oriented type of an idea. But we're going we're gonna to change the everything around. But what that's going to do is actually drain um, already stretched finances within the, the town of Gosstown and Pernardville in general. Multifamily is going to bring in more people. You get an example. You have a 48-unit apartment complex. You put a family in there, and per the United States Census Bureau, a family will have two kids. Now, if you put 48 families into one of these, just one apartment complex, that is 96 kids. 96 kids going to our schools that are already complaining, and they are, and it's justified that there's no money to fix and update the schools. So that's adding an, a million dollars worth to the school budget. So you're saying that the plan is advocating for residential development that the infrastructure cannot currently handle and that the tax base will not be able to support. That is that is just one of the the ramifications of massive development bringing this stuff in. I mean, Hooksit's going through it right now. Londonderry's going through it right now because they signed on and took this money and HUD said, you will build this many low-income apartment complexes. And so, this is what you'll do. Yeah, well, they, ha they have to allow for it. <clears throat> and then you get tax credit developers like we've seen in Manchester. I mean, M Manchester's been flooded with the stuff. Um, and, and it has had a dramatic impact on a number of neighborhoods in schools. When I started working for city government back in the early 90s, the the number of kids on free and reduced hot lunch in Manchester schools were right around 30, 33%. Today, it's half. And areas that were once considered sort of suburban neighborhood schools um, have seen dramatic shifts in the demographics of their population. And the constant in all of them has been like what happened here, uh, right uh, at the Byron Bridge. Yes, Okay. Mm -hmm. Right uh, at the base of the bridge. Right at the base of the bridge, which was a 180-unit low-income housing development mm -hmm. uh, that completely obliterated the demographic of the Parker Varney School. Right. So, um, and, and, and these things have impacts, and they're very difficult for communities to absorb on large scales. Well, it, and that's just, if you look at it, just a school budget alone, the the, the the tax base that these things bring in is not equal to res single-family residential neighborhoods. Right. So you're going to be spending out more than you're bringing in, and then you. Have so they're tax base losers, is what you're exactly. saying. They incur costs that cannot be recovered by not even close by the uh, taxes that they generate. Not not from what what I'm looking at, and the and the, also that you get the the what's going to bottom line is going to happen is a relatively few people are going to make a killing off this at, at the expense of the residents and businesses, existing businesses of, of, of Pennardville. I mean, you brought up earlier Cody's Corner. Prime example. Mm -hmm. You've got, you, you know, the, the Cody, the, the diner only has parking, very limited parking. If this planned Pernardville thing goes through. They'll have no parking. <laughs> they'll have no parking. Because it will be turned into a place for trees people will have no access to their homes because they'll the way they're going to reroute streets and things and when that was brought up at this planet palooza thing um what was said was oh there's on beyond street parking well uh, the people who did this plan come from tennessee they don't get 48 inches of snow <laughs> where they ban parking on the road you people around here have driveways for a reason to get their vehicles off the road. What's this going to do? You know, it, there's going people are going to have to park on the street. There's a parking ban. What are you going to do with your car? We're going to become downtown Manchester. And what they're trying to do is exactly they're they're 
We're trying to put some of these residential housing units into Shaw's parking lot, for example, where Pizza Hut was. Yeah. Well, it is now. Mm-hmm. If this goes through, it was going to be where Pizza Hut was. And they're going to put housing right there with the idea of shared parking because they said that Shaw's parking lot is a waste of space. So what they're trying to do is put housing in there, link it up with the housing that's behind Rite Aid, and link it up with which new is hu- a low-income housing project. By exactly the way, built by Greater uh, Southern New Hampshire Neighbor Works. They call yes, well, now. that's what Neighbor Works does. Yeah. Our time is 18 minutes before the hour. We continue now with Pennardville resident Dana Benner discovering the objections he has to plan Pennardville's proposed master plan. So one of the things that you were saying before the break, Dana, and I, it caught my attention when I looked at the draft plan. I haven't looked at the final, but I looked at the draft. Um, and that was they seemed to be interested in creating this network of roadways that sort of ring um, mass roads. Some of them are already there, but they're not very well used. If you've been around Pennardville long enough, you kind of know where the, the 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 neighbors know where the bypasses are. And it seemed to me that they were going to make some relatively quiet residential streets become more main thoroughfares for traffic as a way of uh, diverting traffic from Mast Road. Did I read that right? Yeah. Well, actually, what got us involved more into this more intensely was. At the Plana Palooza, they had they they boasted this big thing about having having the whole community involved in the drawing, and and then they put the little flowery pictures. Yeah. And what what it was is it was relatively few people actually showed up. But what was I noticed on one of the maps was they had lines drawn from across Hague, Joffrey, and Patane streets. Mm-hmm. Well, anybody who knows Pernardville knows that Hague, Patane, and Joffrey Street are dead end roads. Yes, they are. And they butt up against the condos up in, on Daniel Plummer Road. Yep. And what was proposed was opening up those streets to greater traffic flow to ease the strain on Mast Road. And we're looking at this and we're going, what? First of all, Mast Road, I mean, Joffrey Street, Hague, and Patain are, are narrow streets. They're not made for... For right. back and forth traffic, they're very narrow, actually. Yes, and there's kids, there's young kids on every one of those streets, and it's relatively safe because it is a dead end. Well, they were going to open it up right into the condos, or what they wanted to do was put a linking street, so instead of having them dead end, they'd go into another street, so it would look like a big M, is what it would look like, and link into Daniel Plummer Road. But there's no property up there, which means that they'd have to do eminent domain and take property from someplace. Well, we fought and fought and fought. Uh, We went around and we got uh, uh, signed petitions with about 200 signatures on it. And we fought and they weren't going to change it. They were going to do something different. They were trying to blow us off, ignore us, and we didn't let them ignore us. And we've been told that this is off the plan now. You know, as far as I, you know, as well as I do, that it can easily go right back on just as quick. Well, sure. Um, Yeah. So when you open up dead ends, you fundamentally change the character of a street. Um, And and I think when you take a neighborhood like Pennardville that is largely uh, smaller single family homes and you start the mass construction of uh, multi-unit housing, you fundamentally change the traffic count, the character, and the stability of the neighborhood. I, now, I know that there was some talk about, uh, and they do what planners always do, by the way. Oh, well, this is the Ice House District. This is the, right. the you know, the, the Cody's Corner. This is the this. This is they the do, that. What they do is it's, it's, it's called divide and conquer. Uh, right. And because uh, everybody's going to have their own little sort of neighborhood within a neighborhood, their own area within an area. But we were talking in the uh, during the break about plans uh, with the ice house. It was about 35 acres of land up there that's currently for sale. Right. What that is is – And just so people know, what's the corner uh, for people who might – Daniel, uh, Daniel Palmer Road and Mast Road is Daniel the corner. Daniel Palmer and Mast Road. Right where the ice house is, there's a little pond there. On the other side of the pond is Tire Warehouse. Yep. Uh, 
that building that's there, an already existing building, used to, has housed everything from a children's museum to a bank you know, to real estate. It's been the whole nine yards. And what that is is that whole property encompasses 35 acres of land along that little pond and borders up on to, on, against Daniel Plummer Road on one side, and on the other side is Mash Road, and then the final, the fourth side is up against that commercial property up on Daniel Plummer. Okay. That's for sale. And if this Plant Penardville thing goes through, they're, they're, the owners are going to up for a big killing because what they wanted to do is sell that property off. And if you look at the, at the plan, it shows multifamily complexes on that 35 acres of land. The idea is to they, they keep saying we want to preserve the ice house. If you look at the plan, you read the plan. They yes, don't come I out. I did read about the preservation of the ice they house. They don't come out and say we're going to put apartment complexes here. What they say is we want to save the ice house. Well, okay, they think that the history of Pernardville is strictly that ice house, and you're going to put a car, apartment complexes all the way around it. It doesn't make sense. And it's been proposed at the ad hoc committee by one of the committee members, actually, to turn that building that's already existing there into a historical society slash museum to de- to show the diversity of, of Pernardville, to show our cultural heritage, to be an extension and a, a link to the Goffstown Historical Society, mm-hmm. to make it open to the public, to make that land parkland where, you know, you can bring your kid. They ride their bike. They they can play baseball. Whatever the case may be, and it incorporates the ice house. Wonderful idea. Get shot down at the. Didn't, that wasn't. No, no, no. We can't have that. And you know, there's a bunch of things that you know. There's certain people on that planning committee have ulterior motives, and and they're moving in that direction, and they don't want to hear the people on the committee who have different ideas, and they don't want to hear from the public. You know, so people need to get down to this meeting on the 30th and voice your opinion. Stand up and say something to these people. Now, what is the uh, what is the process of approving this? So you have this proposed plan. Does it does it have to be adopted by the planning board? Does it have to be approved by the voters at a town meeting? I, I, I'm out of my element when it comes to what happens in these towns. What happens now is it's going to go on the 30th. It's, they're opening it to public, and then they're going to – people are allowed to voice their opinion, supposedly. Now, whether it's listened to or not is an entirely different story. But the the ad hoc committee does not make the final decision. They take that, if they agree with what the final draft of the plan says, then they turn around and they hand it to the planning board. And now it's got to be tossed about on the planning board to get approved. Then it's going to have to go to the zoning board to have these zoning things changed for all these little nuances to be built if it doesn't get to the planning if the planning board shuts it down it doesn't go to zoning if the planning board av- approves it it can be shot down at zoning so the people will have no say it's just eventually easy. eventually it'll be we have no say we have uh ward three alderman pat long who represents manchester's down line uh, downtown on the line good morning alderman long good morning rich and uh, good morning to you yeah. rich i just wanted to make a couple of comments. One is that uh, downtown has plenty of off-street parking for snow emergencies, so that's not an issue. The only issue with that is how far people may have to walk to go park their car. Uh, right. The second thing is what, what kind of flags me with this Bernardville, uh, Bernardville Palooza is that um, I'm wondering if Goffstown has their required moderate to low-income housing. If they don't, then I could see an avenue with which they could uh, meet that requirement through Pernardville. You understand what I'm trying to get at here? Yes. So and, you, you're uh, perhaps suggesting that the town planners in Goffstown are trying to meet their – now, is this a state or federal requirement for a certain amount of low-income housing, state. Alderman? It's a state. You may want to ask the mayor when he goes in. Is this that least, workforce housing thing? Exactly. Yeah, that every development is required to uh, meet a certain uh, percentage of moderate to low income. Uh, Manchester is uh, Manchester has enough moderate to low income, so we're not required. 
and I agree with your guests that in Manchester anyways, I would look at uh, proposals for housing with reference to HUD because we're, we have we have enough, we have, we're above and beyond what we're required with respect to moderate and low income. So any HUD money project uh, would add to that uh, you know, qualification and we don't need it in Manchester. So I agree with your guess with respect to uh, HUD money. But if your town doesn't have that required uh, qualifier, then you know, I could see Golf Town saying, hey, I got an idea, let's uh, have Pernardville uh, let's look into Bernardville and see if they could help us meet our qualifications. And, uh, you know, with respect to Manchester, if the surrounding towns, Hookset, Gofftown, Bedford, Auburn, uh, you know, if they're, if they're not Litchfield, if they're not meeting their qualifier, where do these moderate to low-income people come to? They come to Manchester. So, uh, you know, it's unfair for Manchester to get that burden. Right. So you're not commenting on whether or not it should be in Pennardville, uh, Pat, you're you're saying perhaps Goffstown is trying to meet the state requirements by jamming it into Pennardville. Yeah, that's what I would look at first. Is Goffstown uh, meeting their moderate to low income requirements? All right. Well, uh, Pat, thanks so much for calling in. You bet. That uh, was a good addition to our conversation. He is also a state representative. Uh, he used to represent Ward 3, but now he is in one of the floatorial districts and represents Wards 1, 2, and 3 as a state rep in the general court. Um, you know, we're getting toward the end of the segment. I think this is an important discussion to have. Would you be willing to stay with us for one more segment? Sure. Okay, good. We'll carry you over into the seven o'clock hour then. So what, um, so it's got to go from the ad hoc committee to the planning board, from the planning board to the zoning board, and then if the ad hoc committee, the planning board, and the zoning board all give this plan the thumbs up, is it adopted or does it come to the town folk for a vote? It comes to a, for a vote. It has to come for a vote. Okay. But the tricky thing about voting is, one, you have to have people show up to vote. Now, and, it, does it come to a special vote or does it come to a regular town meeting vote would, in March? What, what it's going to go on the ballot in March. It's got to go on the ballot in March. Right. And what, what happens is, one, you need people to show up to vote. And then two, the wording on the ballot has to be that people understand it because it's very tricky. They can, you can play words in every different direction. I mean, you can, you can write it out saying, if you don't uh, if you vote no on Pernardville, well, if you vote no, it could be, does it mean no, you don't agree with say me or d you don't agree with the plan. Right. So the ballot question in and of itself could be an issue. Right. And the wording on the ballot too, so, you know, they, you, you mentioned earlier it's be like the, the, inc the incubator. Right. Everybody thinks incubator is something you hatch chickens in. <laughs> okay. Well, it is Bernardville. Right. Exactly. But, you know, when you use it in the context of, like, say, Anselm's College, it means an entirely different, you right. know, and people don't understand well, that terminology. That's one of the things that I wanted to talk to because while I am not a Bernardville resident, um, I grew up in West Manchester. I consider myself to be relatively – wise about what neighborhoods are and it surprised me that they considered St. Anselm part of Pennardville. I never have. I, I don't know anybody really who does um, consider except my sidekick DJ Dave uh, uh, but I, I, I don't know a whole lot of people who would ever consider St. A's part of Pennardville but there are other aspects of this plan uh, that I noticed uh, that I want to continue the discussion with. I mean, I truly believe a community's character and identity is at stake. I believe a number of communities are facing these planning issues uh, as the federal government pushes us towards so-called sustainability, which, by the way, means one thing and one thing only when it comes to planning, and that is greater density, a more intense use of space. Um, Presumably to save untouched space, but a more intense use of space always means greater density when they talk about sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that these issues are being faced in a number of communities and that this conversation could be helpful. So we're going to continue it after we take this break for traffic, weather and sports. We continue now with Dana Benner. He is a Pennardville resident raising the red flags over the Plan Pennardville, Plan of Palooza results. That is going back to the ad hoc committee for, I guess, adoption. 
uh, but not first without public participation. The public is going to get to comment on this. There is a meeting on July 30th at what time? At 6 p.m. At 6 p.m. Where? At the uh, it's Goffstown Town Hall. At Goffstown Town Hall. So they're going to yank you out of your Penardville neighborhood to actually go downtown <laughs> to the town hall. See, now I would think that if it was all about Penardville and getting the feedback from Penardville, they'd have it right here at the Bartlett Elementary School. The thing is, they don't want feedback from Penardville. Oh. Now, uh, Alder, uh, Representative Alderman Long from Manchester called in um, ab- about uh, Goffstown and every community's requirement that when it does planning, it make a provision that certain amount of its housing be low and moderate income. Do you have any idea whether or not Goffstown already meets the state requirements in that? I am not sure on those figures or, or what where it stands on that. But I do know that at the ad hoc committee meeting, I did make the suggestion that they put some of this low-income housing down in the village. If they Goffstown doesn't meet these requirements, do you think why, they should spread it around, not sure, just dump it all in sure, Pernardville? Be, you know, it's you know, Pernardville's the easy way of getting rid of a problem. So. If they, I made the suggestion, but obviously that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen down in the village. Well, you know, one of the things that I noticed in taking a look at the maps and the areas that they had created, like they created this grand park at the center of Pinardville, which Mm -hmm. looks to me like they took a bunch of land from the uh, center Pinard Plaza here to do it. Um, it. It seems that they're taking privately owned land for public purposes, and then they're taking uh, th- th- then they're creating a situation where other privately owned land can meet, say, low-income housing things. And I noticed, and this is going to sound really weird, I noticed that they like lined mast road with trees. And, uh, I, and with all of the traffic rerouting and the opening up of dead ends and the rerouting of traffic from mast road to secondary streets that uh, largely run between – uh, Mast Road and say the Piscataquag River because I'm not really good with my north, south, east, west. Right. What, what direction is that anyway? Um, that they were they were fundamentally going to start changing the character and a lot of it involved seizing private lands. Well, the, the, there is to be fair to the ad hoc committee, they have told us that they the the opening of the dead end roads is a dead issue. So let's you know give credit where credit's due on that one. You know, they, they did assure us that that's not going to happen. But the idea of changing the zoning to mixed use with the provision that if it's currently residential, you don't, they're not telling you you have to put a commercial building on it. But there is a little caveat on a lot of this stuff that basically gives them the right to do an overlay zoning, which means that it will trump the mixed-use zoning, meaning if they decide that they want to move and do something, their their overlay zoning can over. The overlay allows more uses in the same area. Exactly. Okay. So they can take it. Now, you know whether they're going to do an eminent domain thing and take private property, I don't know. Well, I mean, to, to, to create some of the parks and some of the other, you know, little green areas that they've identified in their maps, they would have to. Well, exactly. What the example is down by uh, College College Road. Right. They want to change that whole, that whole corner. Now, granted, that corner can be dangerous coming on to Mast Road. It can be. But I think the end result is they want to make a, like a little park there. There's a business called, is it Pizza Mart or Pizza? Uh, uh, yeah, Pizza Market. Yeah, right there. What's going to happen to him? Right. You know what's going to happen when they change right across the street, um, where there's a right next to Bartlett School. There's a a mall type of area. Yeah, down that's in there. the Center Pernard Plaza. Right. They that's going to disappear. If you look at the map, that's going to disappear. The roads going in the back there are going to disappear. Right. You know. Are they, and the problem is, is those businesses that if some of them have been there for a little bit, especially in the, in the plaza, they're, those are renters. They have no other place to go. The only one who's going to make any money off this is the landowner, maybe. But if they say, I want a million dollars for that piece of property, and the, and the town says, no, we're going to use that property to make a beautiful location park. We're going to offer you five thousand dollars, and then take the rest by eminent domain. 
depending on how they word things, they can. Right. Well, and, and actually, that's where my financial services office was, was in that plaza before I consolidated mm-hmm. it with a, um, an out, uh, a fellow vice president with the company in Manchester. Well, but let's get to this, because one of the things that Brian Rose said in the interview, um, again, to take it back to where we started, was about the zoning. Uh, and about the the setbacks and the various issues where Penardville being an urban area is out of phase with the rest of Goffstown. In reading through the draft plan, I did not see any talk about setbacks or uh, anything. I, I saw references to something called smart code, but I didn't see where the actual technical details of the zoning ordinance was being changed to make the uses in Penardville um, conform with their reality inside of their zoning ordinance. Did I did I miss something no, there? No, they, they don't. Yeah, uh, but it's but it's so the stated what, purpose of needing to make exceptions or needing to change the zoning ordinance for Penardville because it doesn't look like the rest of Goffstown and doesn't really fit into the zoning ordinances that govern the town don't exist in this plan. Well, it 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 does and it doesn't. What they're doing is they they're typical political, legal thought process is you put all the pretty pictures and the hand-holding and the singing kumbaya going down the street all in the front. And then there's little there's little things slipped in. It's rope-a-dope. Right. So they, they don't want you to focus on the bad. They want you to get all excited and a warm and fuzzy over the trees and the in the sidewalks and everything else. I, I I was surprised by how much ink they gave to the idea that uh, uh, St. A's College needs to be more a part of Penardville and how they talked about using encouraging the college to buy up land on College Road to expand down and put various uh, uh, buildings there and and I, as I said before maybe maybe I'm missing it but. I just never considered – St. A's was always the hill. It was St. A's. It was never Penardville. St. Anselm Drive is the boundary of Penardville. Am I wrong about that? And I, I've never – since I've lived here, I didn't re- consider St. A's as part of well, Penardville. Well, you've only been here for 30 years. Yeah, I know. You know, I'm a, I'm a youngster. But – well, physically I'm not a youngster, but being here I am. Yeah. Um, but I've never considered uh, St. A's as part of Penardville. Part of Goffstown, yes. Part of Penardville, no. And – and I've always – and St. A's has, is given by the town a lot of power, a lot of leverage. And henceforth, they are an entity on to, them, to themselves. They really are. And so there, I would consider them a district of Gosstown. You got St. A's. You got Penardville. You got Grasmere. You got the village. Right. You know, these are all districts of the town of, of Don't Gosstown. forget the mountain. And, the, and the, the mountain, exactly. See, I know my geography. Um, well, let me, let me ask you this. Does Penardville as a neighborhood, as it exists today, does it work? Yes. I mean, it seems to me that the biggest problem Penardville has is a stupid town that for three years kept shutting down Mass Road, uh, to do sewer work and then do it again and then do the roadways and all this fun stuff. Well, one of your selectmen, I think, lost office in the last election because he was basically of the opinion that it was no big deal. And Penardville showed up and said, the hell it's not. Uh, and it had a devastating effect on the businesses here. Uh, and, and I saw it firsthand, mm-hmm. the way they managed or mismanaged that public works project. But a, as a neighborhood, as a, as a business district, as a residential neighborhood, um, as a community, does Penardville work? I think it does. And – what would you say are the challenges that Penardville faces and the answers to those challenges? Because I got to tell you, I, I mean, the way they handle this place, especially in the winter, the way they keep the sidewalks and the street clear, uh, the way traffic moves through it, the way the residential neighborhoods have been protected from the development of Mass Road by design or default, um, it, it seems to me – and oh, what, what is it? Coming up in a in a few weeks, it'll be like the big Penardville, Penardville businesses get together and they have their their thing at the hardware store and the bowling alley. Mm-hmm. And the, it just seems to me like it's a community that is not in need of any help to be better. I, th- if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think it's just minor, maybe just minor tweaks that need to be done. And I think, and and 
a, a friend of ours, Donna Pernard, put it the best way. Um, yes, every community needs to be tweaked. There's always something that needs to be done. But we don't need state funds. We don't need federal, federal funds. funds. We don't need someone telling us what we need to do, when we need to do it, how we need to do it. We, you know, the community of Pernardville can say, okay, we need to get this done. Will it be done tomorrow? No. There's no funds available. But as soon as things get done, they work together as a team to do it. So it's minor things that can be changed. As a whole, that's what drew me to Pernardville to begin with. It was a close-knit type of community. Yes, there were small businesses. We weren't far from conveniences, but we were far enough away that, to be insulated. Um, we have a 90 by 100 yard. I have a garden in the backyard. It's like short of the white picket fence. It's, you know, the leave of the beaver house. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's what drew me here. Not. And it's a stable community. There's not a lot of turnover in the single family homes here in Pennardville. It doesn't seem to be. People stay here. For the most part, I mean, everybody on my street, for the longest time, I was the new guy. Now I'm one of the old timers, but for a long time, it was I was the new guy. But people come and people go, but for the most part, they people hang tight. Right. Hmm. Well, we are going to link to when with this art uh, with this uh, interview, we're going to link to the final draft. We'll have the information about the uh, meeting on the thirtieth posted. Uh, and we just ask you to keep us up to date. So I, I think I, I appreciate your taking the extra time with us this morning and for bringing it to our attention uh, and, and asking for the time. Our good friend Bill Wynn from GoffstownToday.com has been here videoing this, so we will have it up on his website, our YouTube site. Of course, our archive will be up this morning by between 9.30 and 10. Um, and, and we think that these are the important discussions that need to take place in communities before decisions are made. One final question. Do you think that without these federal funds that require sustainability planning, that um, a master planning effort in Pennardville would look anything like this? No. Dana Benner, Pennardville resident, political science professor at a local college, guy who's only been in the neighborhood for 30 years. Thanks for sharing your time and your your insights with us here on Dread at Large. You're welcome, and thank you for having me on.